Las Vegas is a town which has built its reputation with top performers, high rollers, and a go-for-broke attitude. This is the third stop on the Pro Bowlers Tour, the Showboat Invitational, where in the past, top performers have rolled good numbers to take home high stakes. ABC Sports presents... Live from Las Vegas, Nevada, it's the Professional Bowlers Tour. The glamour capital of the world. Las Vegas has become a bowling mecca. Today, five outstanding bowlers from all over the country. In the fifth position, making his first appearance ever in the championship round, 24-year-old Ron Williams. He'll be going against 12-time PBA champion Larry Love. Larry is one of the grand old masters of this tour. In the third spot, another veteran with five titles, Gary Skidmore. And in the number two position, 31-year-old David Ozio. Last year, David reached the TV finals twice. He won them both. But Ron Bell is the player in the most enviable position. He'll sit and wait, having to bowl but one game. One win away from $33,000. You are looking live at one of the largest bowling establishments in the world. 106 lanes here at the showboat, adjacent to the gambling casinos, where a marvelous crowd has gathered to watch the pros participate in the oldest tournament on the tour. And hi, everybody. I'm Tim Brandt. Some 300 bowlers began this tournament on Monday. 56 games later, we are down to the final five. Sudden death, a stepladder playoff type format that just seems to build the pressure, seems to add the pressure. It reminds me of a golf tournament. You play four rounds, but having it all decided on just one hole. The rules are simple. You lose, you're gone. But if you win, you have the chance to take home $33,000 in prize money. Working with me again today, our expert commentator, a member of the Hall of Fame, Nelson Burton, Jr. Oh, it should be fun. Thank you, Tim, and welcome back to the Pro Tour. Thank you. Tim, I think you made a great point. Pro bowlers have to be long-distance runners during the week, 56 games, but they have to be sprinters on Saturday afternoon. And the history of the Pro Bowlers Tour in 1986 has been the newcomers. Remember week number one. Randy Peterson went through four players in winning his first title. Then in week number two, Del Warren came out of the pack, won four matches, averaged better than 240 as he defeated a veteran field. And today, the story is no different. We have two newcomers in the field, Ron Williams in the first match and Ron Bell, our tournament leader. He has to go through three veterans to win that first title, and the key for him to win it has been carrying the 10-pin. The players all week long have been able to hit the pocket, hit the pocket in the showboat but they haven't been able to carry the 10 pin. Larry Lobb told me that in 34 games of qualifying, he left 58 10 pins. Now last year, we had some great scoring on the championship pair. Marshall Holman started a game with nine in a row, just missed the 300 and had a 279. So Tim, we could see that type of action today, but I think the most important story is, can the number one winner of the first match go all the way again today? Okay, Bo, we are ready for our first match, and it is now, I believe, that these bowlers really feel the pressure. The nervous stomach that gives all the sudden death play off its feeling. Harnessing that adrenaline, that positive energy, I think, is paramount. Ron Williams, making his first championship round appearance ever, has to be feeling that pressure. 24 years old from Chahokia, Illinois. This is his sixth year as a PBA member. First game, first frame. Leaves one up. Tim, that's the pin we talked about, the key pin at the showboat. And the reason that they are leaving so many 10 pins this week, uh, very simply, they're playing the outside line and it has a tremendous drive or hook power towards the back end. The six pin flies around the top of the 10. Ron Williams, a cross lane. Going after the cross lane mark. Got it. Well, one thing that has been consistent this week, the bowlers say that the backside of the lanes have been holding very true, carrying to the pocket. Well, that's a key, Tim. Um, if the lanes get very slick or oily at the back end, it causes some low scores. This week, the back ends have stayed very dry. Larry Lobb leaves the same pin, number 10. The ideal style of Larry Lobb, the golden arm swing. He has a full extension. Watch how he locks his elbow at the top of his swing. Comes down through a good knee bend, locked elbow all the way through. What a great practice vehicle. Keep that arm locked all the way through your shot. High follow through. Got 
got it. And I don't believe he was that sure, but all the way, it started to slide. Larry's an interesting story. 43-year-old journeyman inducted into the Hall of Fame last year. Perhaps the master craftsman, Bo, when it comes to form and delivery. Lobs have always been a delivery player. He has a five-step delivery and holds that ball very loosely in a fingertip grip. Good concentration. When he gets going, Tim, he is awesome. He can be tremendous on a TV pair. He got it. Larry Lobb carries them all. Ron Williams, um, kind of a unique style. He has his elbow come a little bit away from his body on the on the push away and back swing, but he straightens it out as he comes through and gets good leverage. Hit that one right smack in the sweet spot. You know, that crooked arm backswing isn't the picture-perfect clinic style that you would expect. Well, watch where it comes. It, com it comes away on his push away, and he gets behind his back. Now, arm is away from his body, but he gets that ball tucked down underneath, arm close to his body, and follow throughs directly towards the target, and that's the key. Good shot, matches all even, third frame. That unusual backswing came about in an effort to get more speed on the ball. Hit high, left side, left three up. Tim, and that's what happened right there. He got a little soft with that shot, and the ball just started hooking too much. Here he is. The ball looks like it's in good shape, then breaks very sharply on the back end, leaving the 3 six, ten spare. Needs to convert this to stay even with Larry Lobb. He's been tough trying to convert a split or cover a spare. But leaves one up here. Open frame. Once again, I think he played too far of a wide angle. See where the ball is way out on the last two boards. You need to go across lane and throw the ball straight at spares. You don't need the big hook. Be accurate. He's given Lobb a tremendous opening. Experienced players should jump on it right here. Take a 22-pin lead. There is a on a strike. Has a double bagger. We should mention here, Bo, that our buddy and colleague Chris Schenkel is in Lancaster, Pennsylvania today, and we will see him later on Wide World of Sports with boxing. Some tremendous fights coming up. The Olympic guy is going at it, namely Mark Breland and Tyrell Biggs, both undefeated. Going after the turkey. No, leaves one up. Boy, oh boy, there's just nothing you can do about it. It has to be disconcerting to lob, although he's in the top five out of a field of 300 players. Watch the six pin, the second pin on the right-hand part of your screen. Bang! It just, it elevates right around the 10 pin. Just too much power. Sometimes you pay a penalty for too much power. Their lob had another potentially good hit, left a tough spear. And he takes the spare and so as the machines jingle in the casino next door and the pins rattle here we'll be back with a sudden death playoff right after these messages stay with us quite an establishment here at the showboat the casinos adjacent to those casinos are the bowling lanes 106 this is Ron Williams and again leaves the 10 well, that's going to be the whole key, Timmy. The lanes are rolling beautiful, and that's one of the things we've had in the last five or six years in professional bowling. The players are using polyurethane balls mostly, and the balls hit the pins very hard, but sometimes you pay a penalty for hitting the pins so hard, leaving the 10 pins, the 8 pins, and the 7 pins. Ron Lane spare, and Ron Williams has that, and Bo making his first championship round appearance ever. And all the talk about the lanes and the pressure and the lights, do they overcompensate? Well, I don't really think so, Tim. Uh, Ron Williams is a very disciplined, well-practiced player. I, I think we're seeing more and more young players that are practicing a ton of games coming out here. And you can practice around the nervousness. I'm sure he's a little bit apprehensive, but he's throwing the ball so well, except for one frame, the third frame. He trails by 21. Let's see what happens. Strike. Exactly the way it's supposed to be done. His brother-in-law took him to a bowling center when he was 12, and he's been bowling ever since. There's the first breakdown. We told you $33,000 for the first place winner. 
and drops off drastically after that. Larry Lobb. Leaves three up. Big trouble right there. Larry Lobb just pulls the ball slightly inside his target. He was aiming around the first arrow. He hit around the seventh board, two boards inside the first arrow. Leaves the four, six, seven. He'll just shoot for the two pins on the left side to keep the count. Good velocity takes down two, leaves one up. Now you see the style of the two players, Ron Bell, uh, Ron Williams on the left and Larry Lobb on the right. Now watch Ron Williams, how he brings that ball behind. Look at how that arm goes out us away. Now watch how he brings it back underneath. As you see Larry Lobb with that golden arm swing straight back in perfect position. Now watch as they come to the bottom of the swing, as you would see, they both end up in the same position. Larry Lobb, silky smooth, has that golden arm swing as you talked about, Bo. Okay, now this is really the lesson to learn. Now watch how they both get underneath the ball. See that right by his foot. Watch Lobb, same way. Drives down in that perfect position. Pivot step, right next to his foot, out over the foul line. They may look a little different getting up there, but in that last half a step, all the pro bowlers look about the same. This is Ron Williams. And again, leaves that elusive 10 pin standing. Now, Tim, the first thought, people would say, well, what can you do about it? We understand why you're leaving the 10-pin. What can you do? What, what you can do is very simply, if you're sharp enough, you can try to hit light in the pocket. Actually, you're not getting the maximum reward for good shots. If you can keep it thin, get the swishers, then you can shoot some big scores. But solid in the pocket, it's just hard to maintain a string. Again, the cross lane spare, he has that. You know, a misconception, bow in this sport has to be that velocity is the key, and that's not always so. Medium speed, I guess, is best for mixing the pins, and you can't carry the pins unless they mix around that lane bin. Well, with medium speed, you lose some control of your ball, and on very light pins, you often will leave a, a tap, uh, Tim, but when you have um, fairly heavy pins, you have to use a, a soft speed. Uh, Today, the players that throw hard are going to end up with the best results. Polyurethane finishes we have on today's lane surfaces require speed. Ten. Same old story, just told in a different way. And there we go. This is the, let me count how many ten pins. One, two, three, four, five, six ten pins we've already had. You see the six pin laid out in the channel, not knock out the ten. We've bowled only six frames in each match we've already had six ten pins definitely the key to victory is who can carry the ten he is so close to hit that pocket time and time again keep in mind on a perfect hit that ball makes contact with only four pins or so then it's pins hitting pins and we'll be back undefeated welterweight mark freeland meets troy wortham who's 25 and 0 Plus, Tyrell Biggs goes for his seventh straight knockout on ABC's Wide World of Sports, next. And we'll be joining our colleague, Chris Schenkel, after our telecast of the bowling today. Olympic gold medalist, undefeated welterweight Mark Breeland, and his first 10-round bout takes on Troy Wortham, who is also 25-0, and also James Quick Tillis going against Tyrell Biggs, the other heavyweight Olympian, and that should be some Dunnybrook. Tim, both those Olympic boxers are going to get a try today. These two fighters they're playing against, they're fighting against today are tough. They could both lose. Larry Lobb leading by eight. There's the hit we're talking about. Keep it light, keep it thin. Then you avoid the 10 pin, and the pin action is phenomenal on the light hit. As you see, the ideal style of Lobb, four-step delivery. Gets that ball in perfect position, slides through the bottom of the swing. Now watch the high follow-through. Gets it wide. Here it comes, rips the rack. He'll like this one. 18 pin lead, Larry Lobb coming up in the eighth, can extend to 28 with another strike. Looks good, takes him down. You know, he won two titles in 1979, but then went dry at 80, 81 and 82. He struggled, changed his game around, and now, really, Bo, trying to climb back up to the top of the profession. Well, Lobb got in the uh, syndrome that many of the older players got into in the early 80s. They tried to become power players after they had been strokers all their life. Lobb has finally given up on that and is going back to his original game. Here comes Williams. Eighth frame. Hits high, leaves three to the right. 
Ron Williams was sensational last night in the clutch. It came down to the 10th frame, the 56th game. He threw three clutch strikes to nose out David Houston and Ernie Schlegel for the number five position. He needs to get a couple strikes going here and put some pressure on Lobb. Here's the spear he missed earlier, the 3 6 10. 3 6 10, standing tall. Leaves one up. Well, there's two things that have been proven today. Number one, that Williams can't carry the 10 pin. He's been unlucky there. But number two, that uh, he needs a little work on the 3 6 10 spare. He's been unlucky in that he left uh, four 10 pins in the match, but he's really dug himself a hole by missing those spares as he trails by 42 pins. If he strikes out, finishes with four in a row, he can end up with 193 lob going at a 205 pace. The ability to adjust is paramount. There you go. There's one. Watch this hit, solid in the pocket, almost leaves a nine pin. There you go, the ball hooks so much that the ball went left of the nine pin. It was actually, it looked like the three pin that took it out. He likes this one. It is hard for me to fathom a 16 pound bowling ball explodes in the pocket and somehow leaves one untouched. Not this time. The lob has showed his, his experience there. He, he trusts his swing, he trusts his game, he goes to the lighter hit, Tim, and he's not leaving the 10-pin. He's op opened up an insurmountable gap. Right now he's going at a 225 pace. He has a possible 245. He has shut out Williams. It's going to be Larry Lobb in the second match. There's Pam looking on. Good velocity, brings it home. I have got to believe that the first game bow is always the toughest. Try to get over the tightness, set your rhythm, get the pace. Well, you're right. He's got a very, very tough opponent coming up. We, he got by Ron Williams. Ron Williams it was his own undoing. Larry Lobb, an experienced player, going against another tough, experienced player in Gary Skidmore. Lobb with one more strike would be in the 240s. Not a bad spot to have. Brings it home again and again. Leaves the 10. So, Larry Lobb, the winner of match one, now will move on, and we will have that for you coming up shortly after these messages. The Professional Bowlers Tour, today coming from Las Vegas, Nevada, is being brought to you by Miller Beer. Miller, made the American way since 1855. By Barbasol Shaving Cream, a great shave at a great price. And by Speed Stick Deodorant, the wide stick gives you the edge. Speed Stick Deodorant by Minute. We'll be back after this message and a word from our local stations. Larry Lobb has taken match one. 234 to 173 over Ron Williams, and Larry did it with seven strikes. Ron Williams, five ten pins. Gary Skidmore will be up next. David Ozio sitting on, waiting. Ron Bell up top, waiting for his one game and that $33,000 top prize. Well, Bo, you've developed some pen pals over the last couple of weeks. Well, we uh, put up the graphic of you can write me, and I'll answer your questions. And a number of questions were asked, but there, here's the one that many people thought. It was uh, very simply, how can I qualify for the PBA Tour? And the answer will be coming up. It's fairly simple. A PBA membership, you have to be 18 years of age, 190 average for two seasons, three references, pass the PBA member school. That takes about three days, and the minimum dues is a $125 fine. Then there's some other requirements, then, Tim, to get on the PBA national tour, but that's the essence for qualification of membership. And, and if you have any questions you'd like to ask me, just write the, to that address, and we'll do the best to answer as many as we can. And we're ready for match two with Gary Skidmore on the left, Larry Lobb coming off of those seven strikes and a 234 score in the first match. And he will be up first. Larry trying to carry that momentum into match two and he does. Strike one. All right, watch the pinfall, an ideal strike. One, three, five, nine. The ball hits all th four pins. The other pins do their damage, knocked all 10 pins in the pit. 
Gary Skidmore is making his first TV appearance of 1986, his first championship round of the year. Finished 12th on the money list last year with $81,000. First frame leaves the 10. A powerful Gary Skidmore, good concentration. Once again, he has one of those ideal arm swing. Watch how he locks his elbow at the push away, stays in that lock position all the way through the point of release. A little skip or hop as he lets go of the ball. No, no luck on that shot. Another 10 pin. I saw Skids finish third in the Greater Los Angeles Open last year. And he was really disappointed in himself. Cross lane spare here. Gary's actually off to a very good start this year. He finished 25th at the AC Delco Classic, 10th last week in LA, and the finals here today. Well, Gary Skidmore, Tim, is a uh, just a fine, experienced, well-tuned pro. He, he's won almost $200,000 in the last two seasons on the Pro Tour. Stays active in his game all year round, and uh, he's going to be there for a long time. Good velocity that time. It takes them all with him. And Gary Skidmore has his first strike of the match. No doubt about this one. Bingo. All up in the pit. Two experienced veterans here going to be a tough match. A lot of variety this year in the finals. Well, we've had a lot of different finalists. All Nobody's made the show twice yet. Fifteen different finalists in all three weeks. Double bagger. Larry seems to have found that rhythm. Well, Larry just such an experienced player and relaxed grip. He uh, In his offseason, he runs up Heads up the Tour Times magazine, which is a up-to-date magazine which the players have available to them out here on the tour. Uh, he's one of the first players to use videos or television or camera analysis of his game and style, and it's worked very well for him. Going after the turkey. Left it out far right, four stand. The 2458, the bucket, the hardest spare lobs had to contend with. Now watch the action as the head pin. As it goes to the side, board, there it goes. Now if he got just a little more of that head pin, it would have come back and at least knocked over a couple of those pins. Lob has left himself. A relatively tough spare here. And takes them all out. Great concentration by the 43-year-old journeyman. Just perfect. Ball takes out the 2-5 into the 8. No problem, no danger right there. Skidmore trails by six pins. Gary Skidmore, 2011 and 15 previous TV appearances with a 216 average. There's the same shot, but for a different reason. Skidmore just did not get the lift or power on the ball. As it sticks a little bit at the line, doesn't get the proper leverage. Here he goes. Now watch the action of his speed as he drives through his pivot step. Now he slides. Look, he sticks, 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 stick. You can see his shoulders roll forward. Doesn't get the leverage. He's confronted with the same spear that Larry Lobb was faced with in the third. And he gets the spear. You know the scoring system in bowling, one mistake and it can really take you out of a tournament, or at least hurt you badly. Well, with today's players, they're all so equally matched, Tim, that it's, uh, it's difficult to give anybody a break, but I think you'll find all American sports that way. Just top pros, head to dead competition. Skidmore, solid in the second frame, trails by six, frame, six pins, fourth frame. Short pin wobbles and doesn't go down. Oh my goodness, we're talking about the, the power of the ball entering the pocket. This ball, watch this shot. Now watch what the ball does. Hits the one, three, it breaks so sharply, it drives straight through, chops the five off the nine, the six pin goes to the sideboard, gets a little help, they corral the nine, not to be. There is a type of hit you would have never seen 10 years ago. You hit it right. You said corral. There was a pin behind it, pin in front of it. I think they held it up. <laughs> It'll go down this time. You watch. <laughs> oh, slid by. Well, well. So that sets the tone and the pace for what we have coming up. Gary Skidmore trails by 18. The big guns fire away on the Professional Bowlers Tour. $150,000 in total prize money up for grabs next Saturday on BBC Sports.
ABC and the Professional Bowlers Tour, what a happy marriage that has been. Some of the upcoming stops, of course, our colleague Chris Schenkel will be back with you next week, Bo. Right, and you see the Light Beer Classic from Miami starts the Million Dollar Slam. If somebody can win all three of the Miller tournaments, they get a bonus of $1 million. Then the U.S. Open is over there in Venice, Florida. Then back to St. Louis for the $125,000 St. Louis Open. Larry Lobb leads by 18, fourth frame, right-hand lane. Good swing and strikes it out. You know, we were talking before the match. You said that Larry had talked about retirement so often. You asked him about that. Well, I've been trying to cut back for about two or three years. I like to cut back to about 10 tournaments, but you know how habits are. And uh, so uh, recently, about four months ago, I got involved with Paul Caldwell in a marketing company that he's regional vice president at, and it's been going very well at home. And Hopefully, I can just cut back now. I hope this is my last tournament to the Firestone. And Paul Caldwell, uh, another top player from the PBA Tour, was former PBA National Championship, and they're operating that business in the Tucson area. Not a bad place to settle down. Lob, 18-pin lead, can make it 28 with a strike. Fifth play, playing off the strike, leaves one up. You know, this is such a large house with a huge crowd. Often to the left, as we look on, they can't see the seven pin, or to the right, the 10. Well, sometimes they cheer for <laughs> what they think is a potential strike is, uh, is not so. There we see Larry Lobb leave the four pin. Didn't get a good break there. This to maintain an 18 pin lead. Four standing. Gone. So the lead remains at 18 and Gary Skidmore now really has to put things together and do it quickly. Skidmore, let's see how he reacts uh, to that glaring error in the fourth frame. There's his wife, Sherry Skidmore, uh, was a great bowler at Slippery Rock State University in Pennsylvania. Brings it around and takes him down. Strike. There's the reaction. And what about the concentration? Well, watch how he keeps his eyes on the target. I think that's the most important thing to bowling well under pressure. See, he keeps his eyes on the target, eyes on the target, never hardly even moves his head. Now he looks up when the ball is well down the lane, and he gets the perfect result. And coming up later, Bo's tip will be a combination of the mental and physical, how to read these lanes and find the strike line. Skidmore to cut the lead to eight. Did it. Here comes Gary Skidmore. That's the kind of hit he needs. We've seen the solid pocket hit is not dependable. Keep it light and you strike almost 100%. We talked about the pressure in this type of format for the bowlers themselves, but you keep seeing the wives and how do you think they feel? Stomachs churning as Larry Lobb comes back up. Lobb is going to be very, very tough to stop, Tim. He's a disciplined player. He's going against another very experienced player. As you see, Pam Lobb, who just flew up from Tucson today to watch her husband bowl in the championship round. But Lobb has been there so many times. Remember, he had the record 10-21 series he shot back when he won the King Louis Open in 1962. That's better than 255 average for four games on a championship round pair. So when he gets locked in, look out. 11 strikes on the day. Make it 12 for Larry Lobb. So things start to heat up here at the showboat. And with an 18-pin lead, Larry Lobb right now seemingly in control. Joe Antonora, the man who represents the 3,000 PBA national and regional members who uh, have earned the right to become PBA professionals, hang their sign out on the wall. Super guy watching his stars in action, Gary Skidmore. Has a double working seventh frame, trails by 18 pins, can cut the lead of Lobb down to eight. On the right is what he looks at. He sends it down the pipe. Into the pocket, carries all ten. Strike for Gary Skidmore, and he needs some of those badly right now. Two players that have been there before, they're both winners. They both will not lose. One of them has to get beaten, but they will not lose, and there's a big difference. Skidmore, great clutch player, Lobb, just the same. is going to go to the 10th frame. Who can carry in the 10th? Right now, Skidmore can once again take the lead as his say saw is back and forth, 8th frame. Skids has so much natural talent. He 
Eighth frame going for his fourth strike. And gets it. Hit him thin and watch him spin. There he goes. One, three. Now watch the action as the five pin as it drives over in the four, seven area. The head pin comes back over the wall. Watch Sherry Skidmore. Good bowler herself, but she knows the score and how much money's involved in this match. We told you the perfect hit. The ball makes contact with only four pins or so. Then it's pins hitting pins. Larry Lobb. Strike. This is the best action we've seen all year, Tim. We've had some good scores last week. Del Warren, as he wiped out a couple of opponents, but it was he just ran over them. He was shooting 250s and 60s. Today, both players going at a tremendous pace. Possible 256 for Lobb. Possible 248 for Skidmore. The match is still up in the air. Larry's got the turkey going after the four-bagger. Leads by eight. Leaves the 10. Boy, oh boy, that was uh, just a bit tentative as he let it go, but that golden arm swing got the ball in the proper direction. And watch the six pin as it just itches around the 10. Oh, quarter inch, and he had had another strike. Must make the spare, keep the pressure on Skidmore. There's less than a marked difference between the two players. Cross lane spare attempt. Yes. He spans a few decades, doesn't he? Came in about the same time you did, Bo. Well, Larry Lobb has been around for 20-some years. Mike Durbin, 20-some years. Uh, I believe, Tim, that the players that learned to bowl in the late 50s and early 60s, but well, we didn't have the luxury of so many different types of bowling balls to use, uh, whether it be the polyurethane, the polyester, or even the rubber bowling balls, I think we had to learn more different shots. And I think that's allowed us to stay around a little longer. We're not the power players of some of these young players like a a Holman or a Hanley seem to be, but um, I think once you learn the game at the grassroots level, you can stay around a long time. I cannot believe that the conditions back then were as consistent as they are now. Not, not, not even close. Here's Skidmore. Critical shot. Trails by seven. Needs a strike to take the lead. Gary Skidmore. Skidmore, just such a great player playing against another great player. A classic matchup. Watch the eyes under pressure. This is where most pros fail. He lets that arm swing go directly to the target. That head never moved off the target. Takes the lead. Three pins. Right now, he can take a 13-pin lead with another strike. His first lead, 31 years old, from Albuquerque, New Mexico. Good velocity, good carry, and takes them all down. Then there's something he said for just pure strength. He muscled that ball out on the lane. Watch the action as the head pin went to the sideboard. Remember that we said when he left the two, four, five in the fourth frame, he was only a pinch away from getting a strike. There's what happens when you get the ball a little higher. He likes this when you get a break like that. He's in a position now where he can shut out Larry Lobb. One more strike and he shuts out Lob. Best Larry Lobb can bowl is a 237. A valiant game Lobb has rolled. Skidmore is going to be in the 240s. The best action we've seen all year long. So it'll be Gary Skidmore who goes on. And, you know, over the years, national polls conducted indicate that more Americans participate in bowling than in any other year-round sport. Its staying power and popularity is amazing. And with that in mind, Every week, we present to you a bowling tip, and who better to coach you than a Hall of Famer, Nelson Burton, Jr., reading the lanes and finding your strike line. The Professional Bowlers Tour Tip of the Week is being brought to you by Old Spice Stick Deodorant, 24 hours strong. In lesson number one, we showed you how to find the proper position on the approach from the foul line. 
In lesson number two, we showed you how to swing the ball and take your approach all the way through the release and follow through. Now lesson three is one of the most critical things in the sport of bowling, how to find your strike line. First, you establish a starting position on the approach. For me, it's the center board with the, as indicated by the white tape, and I normally try to start the first shot over the second arrow. Now, if the ball misses to the right, I'm going to adjust to the right. If it misses to the left, I'm going to adjust to the left. Let's see what happens on this shot and what kind of adjustment we have to make. I missed the head pin to the right, standing in a position indicated by the white piece of tape on the approach and using the second arrow as my strike target. Now I missed to the right, so I must adjust to the right. The key is three boards on the approach for every one on the lane. So now I'll adjust three boards to the right on the approach as indicated by the yellow tape and move my strike target to the ninth board, one board right of the second arrow as indicated by the yellow tape at the lane and see how it works. Remember, if you miss left, move left. If you miss right, move right. The increments are three boards on the approach to one on the lane. You keep that process going until you find your proper strike position. Now, next week in lesson four, we'll work on spares. <laughs>
Don't forget, coming up next on ABC's Wide World of Sports. As you see the strike here, Tim, we have the Wide World of Sports, and there's going to be some knockdowns and knockouts in that game there, as we see. There you go, the two fighters. You have Breland undefeated, and once again, Tyrell Biggs undefeated, but they have their hands full today. Skidmore trying to come back. Leaves the right side up. Notice so with 3 6 10 standing. A drop off in speed, Tim. Well, we say that Skidmore is rolling the ball about 19 miles an hour. Just guessing. We've checked it before with a radar gun. Larry Lobb was down around 16. Now, Skidmore slowed down on that particular shot. He saw the ball break too much. Here's a spare we saw Ron Williams have a lot of trouble with. But Gary takes it with him. What about the ball itself and the contour and the makeup of it? I would think the softer ball would grip have a little bit more working action for you? Well, there's two schools of thought, Tim. Uh, some of the players like to use the same ball for strikes and spares because it feels the same. They're familiar with it. Some players like to switch to a harder ball for spares because they feel that they have more control over that bowling ball. Skidmore, uh, basically, he uses a fingertip grip and stays with the same ball on strikes and spares because of his great speed. Now watch the loft or lift out over the foul line that Gary Skidmore imparts to the bowling ball. This is a good way to control your hook and still stay underneath the ball. See the ball? It is lofted out about six or seven feet out over the foul line. That's reminiscent of Mark Roth in his heyday. That's a good way to keep control, but you have to be sharp at all times. David Ozio working off a strike. Has a double bagger. By contrast, we see David Ozio roll the ball very smoothly at the foul line, uh, much more under control than Skidmore. Contrast in styles, I have to say Ozio is a, what we call a stranker. He strokes it a little bit and cranks it a little bit. So uh, he has a good blend of power and control. He's playing his own game, Skidmore playing his. Going to be a good match. Leads by one, fourth frame, going after the triple bagger. No just missed to the left. Sent the ball, he wanted it out around the first arrow. Ball cuts right through the middle. We use the 6'10 spare. Now we talked about changing balls. Here, David Ozio picks up a polyester bowling ball, which is much, which will roll much straighter to hopefully make the spare. There you go. These bowlers usually carry two double bags. That's four balls, 64 pounds. The lag from one lane to the next. It gets tiring. We'll be back. The big guns fire away on the Professional Bowlers Tour. $150,000 in total prize money up for grabs next Saturday on ABC Sports. What tremendous congeniality and hospitality we have had here today. Joe Kelly, the chairman of the board, Showboat Hotels. Beautiful place. Captain's a great ship. A lot of bowling tournaments, a lot of money for the pro bowlers, a lot of action around here. Not only gambling, they have boxing and everything else. So if you visit Vegas, try the showboat. Good spot. Here's Gary Skidmore. Leads by one. Can extend his lead to 11 if he can double here in the fourth. He's got to get it going again like he did late last match. There he goes. Gary Skidmore's ball takes out the pins as, as neatly as anybody I've ever seen. His ball comes in in just an ideal position. We've seen this ideal form. Good high foul through, good wrist snap. But when his ball hits that 1-3 pocket, he just snaps that 5 over in that 4-7 area. Tremendous sideboard action. That's two strikes in a row. He had nine strikes last game. No, sir. Completely out of time. You could see it as he came through on his pivot step, his four step. He just basically chunked the ball out there. Actually got a good break that he didn't go right in the nose for a split. Leaves the six, a nine, ten. Now watch how he shoots the spares, Tim. He goes hard and straight. This is the way I'd recommend instead of changing balls. Throw the ball hard and straight. You have better control and a better feel. Nicely done. When we get a chance, let's talk about that. How you adjust and how you can control it. 
Well, if you have a tendency to, to throw hard, as uh, Skidmore does, I, I'm a muscle-type player. Skidmore is, too. We can throw hard and straight. It's easier for a stroker-type player like David Ozio, who has difficulty uh, increasing the ball velocity without losing his timing. He's probably better off changing to a harder ball for spares, which he does. Trails by eight. Fifth frame. Brings it in. No. Bedpost standing. Well, the 7-10, I saw it made twice yesterday. Our tournament leader, Ron Bell, made the 7-10. Mark Roth made the 7-10 yesterday. And watch how he leaves it. He's quickly up on the approach, though. He's going after one of the pins. He's going after the 10. Woof. Could have been a strike. Ends up with a split. No, you really have to nail that to get the bedpost down because of the distance between them. Could have bounced it out. That's the key to making it. Uh, David really hasn't had any good breaks so far in the match. He made a big mistake in the first frame and paid for it. Fifth frame ended up with the 7-10 trails by 21. Leaves the nine. Well, he got a nine count. He actually got a good break. Um, Ozio just kind of out of sync here. He's, he's behind in the match. He's grabbing one ball and changing to another, and I think that has an effect on the game. That's one reason I don't like it. He has never kept the same ball in his hand for five shots in a row. Makes it difficult to keep that real good feel. David coming off his best year ever with winnings of $85,000 last year. Right now it is Gary Skidmore in control with a 21-pin lead. Skidmore does a lot of exhibitions in the offseason, also a lot of charity work. I remember last year he went out for the Big Brothers charity in Wichita with uh, the great Marshall Holman. This is quite a, quite a good guy. Strike. Skidmore, watch the arm swing. That's the key. And the deep knee bend on the second to last step, the pivot step, and how he slides directly towards the target, everything in good position. We are about midway through this tournament final. And I would assume now, Bo, is about the time, if there would be a change in the lane conditions, it would be about now. The lanes seem to have stayed pretty much the same, and I agree with you. There is a good change, but not for Skidmore. Well, he's heating up. It's the same M.O. Getting strong near the end of the match. He leads by 31. Gary Skidmore seemingly in control. Ronnie Bell from Akron, Ohio, is the man with just one win needed today to take this title. But there is pressure there as well. This is his first championship TV round ever. How will he react, Bo? Well, he's been there before. He's never had a title, but uh, then it's been quite a while, and he's gained a lot of experience. But right now, he has to have a foe determined. Ozio trailing by seven, uh, 31 pins, seventh frame, has to get some strikes going. The 10 again. That awful pin that has been standing so often this afternoon. Just not to be. And here David Ozio, once again, this is uh, picking up another ball. It just doesn't seem as uh, Lisa looks on, could not seem to get the feel or the grip of the lane. The expressions tell the story. The best David Ozio can do is 212. He can strike an 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th. He could put some pressure on Skidmore. Skidmore going at a 214 pace. It's not over but Ozio must get striking right here. Concentration, the approach, and the strike. No better sound in the sport of bowling is when they all go down with a clang. Never doubt about this one. All 10 pins in the pit. Three pound, six ounce pins we're using this week. Skidmore. Everything going his way, bowling just super, leads by 32, has a double working, can extend to 42, eighth frame. So pretty, Gary Skidmore. Well, he's machine-like now. He's got his rhythm. He's not using as much muscle. He stretched it out, uh, Tim. We talked at the top of the telecast of how you have to be a sprinter on Saturday. Skidmore did his sprinting at the end of that last game. He finished with eight in a row. He kind of took a little rest there at the early part of this game, the first two frames, but the last five out of six frames have been right in the pocket. Nine strikes last game. Five this one. Come on. 
You can really see when they're under control, Tim. Ninth frame, the ball of Gary Skidmore. Just a copy, carbon copy of what we saw in the eighth. Ozio must strike. No chance to win if he doesn't strike on this ball. And that will do it. It will be a lapper. Ozio, the best he can do is 192, Skidmore a possible 254. Frustration. Some confusion, maybe. And I assume in this sport, Bo, there is so much confusion at times when things just don't go the way they are planned to go, and yet it feels so good at times. <laughs> well, what we need is what you all have in football sometimes. That's a timeout. <laughs> Unfortunately, David couldn't take one. Coming up, we've got the final match of the day with Gary Skidmore moving on, Bell in the wings, and we'll be back. The Professional Bowlers Tour will continue after these messages and a word from your local stations. So the stage is set for the final act of the drama that has become the showboat. It was Larry Lobb after game one, seven strikes with a 234. Gary Skidmore then came on. They had nine strikes each in the best match of the day. 248, 235. And then Gary Skidmore again with seven strikes against David Ozio in the last match. And now here we are, Ron Bell, Gary Skidmore going for the $33,000 top prize. Don't forget, coming up later today, next on ABC's Wide World of Sports, we have a Donnybrook for you. The 147-pounders, Mark Breland, 8-0 with four knockouts. Troy Wortham, 25-0 with 14 knockouts. Now, Wortham is 21-year-old student from Hartford, Connecticut. 18 of his fights have been in Connecticut. Today, with Chris Shankle, it'll be in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Ron Bell has grown up a lot in the last couple of years. We asked him about the PBA maturation process. Well, I think it was just a case of maturity, Bo. Uh, when I first came out, I really wasn't sure what I was doing. Uh, but as time went by, uh, when I came back off the tour, I, I matured a little bit and bowled a lot of tournaments back home and uh, uh, just really kept my head on straight. And when I came out, I was ready. And I think that he made a lot of transitions. Uh, a lot of people have an uh, assumption that the tour is real easy. They come out with high averages from home. Bell was that. He was a classic cranker back then. He's tapered his game down. It's more into control. He has a better mental game. He led a field of 300 players here, 56 games. He's a tournament leader. He's going for his first win on the professional bowlers tour, going against a very, very tough winner, Gary Skidmore. And you beat young Ron way back in 1978. Final match starts with a strike. Gary Skidmore trying to establish control. Skidmore again starting right off. He seems to have that momentum, everything under control, just his body in perfect position. He's relaxed out there. You have a game like that. Ron Bell has his hands full. I want you, you alluded to uh, Tim, I bowled Ron Bell when he was an amateur in the U.S. Open uh, on championship television, and he basically beat himself. And he starts with a Ron ex starts with the ball completely extended. He doesn't have a push away, so his arm's in good position. He has a real nice, loose, relaxed arm swing. Good follow-through, good delivery. Keeps his weight behind the ball. Starts out with a, just a tremendous shot answering Gary Skidmore. It's all even. Ronnie Bell still looking for his first PBA win. Once held the world record for highest four-game setup, 11-27. Bold in league play. Bell for early lead. This is not the Ron Bell I bowled in the U.S. Open in 1978, Tim. Ron Bell did not have that self-confidence. He didn't have that style. He went out there and just attacked on those first two shots. He's put some pressure on Skidmore. That's very important when you're going against an experienced veteran. The last thing's got to come in, and it doesn't all the way. Stays low. Skidmore starting both games the same way. He starts a little slow in the first few frames, gets some momentum going, and closes very strongly. Skidmore almost gets the strike, leaves the seven pin straight across lane. Good spare shooter. 
and Gary takes it out. So we're off to a very quick start. Skidmore controls the lane with his loft and speed. Ron Bell is a type of player that'll adjust back and forth, belly the ball more, change balls. Two different styles, both getting the game done. Gary Skidmore, third frame, final match. Skidmore's had quite a bit of success at the showboat, and the showboat doubles has been in the top five a number of times with his partner, Casey Berry. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Three up. Not to be. Gary knew that shot was just offline all the way three. Now right here, Gary's right up in the center. Watch the action as the ball goes right on through, leaves the four six, seven. He'll just have to throw hard at the two pins and hope he can bounce something out. Splits him, leaves one up. I would assume too, Bo, that the mental aspect of this game now becomes paramount. Bad shot, open, you can't get down on yourself. Don't worry about Skidmore. The guy who has to worry is Ron Bell. 24 pin lead seemingly in the driver's seat, but there's eight frames to go, and he's never been there yet. Well, he leaves the 10 up. Ron Bell needs to win to qualify for the Firestone Tournament of Champions and to be exempt from the Rabbit Squads. The Rabbit Squads are the Pro Tour qualifiers for the players, the non-top 60 players uh, that didn't qualify from the previous year have to bowl before every tournament, so that alone is worth a lot of money and time to get out of that Rabbit Squad. Here for the 10 pin. And he got it. It makes it so tough to be that rabbit, come in, play that extra round, and then jump in with the others. Ron Bell uh, knows concentration, knows discipline. You don't lead a tournament over a period of a week, beat all the best bowlers in the world without knowing how to do it. And, uh, of course, he has a good golfing background. He's a three handicap player, so he knows how to concentrate and play within his game. Fourth frame, 23-pin lead. He's giving it his all. Ron Bell slides a little bit on his pivot step, gets a little far forward, but he gets through the ball, and he likes it. Solid in the pocket. Leads by. Ron Bell leads by 23 pins, fourth frame. He has six frames away from a trip to the Firestone Tournament Champions. We'll be back after this. And there's a man who's visiting the tournament, Jerry Baltz, Executive Director of the National Bowling Hall of Fame, representing the American Bowling Congress, the Hall of Fame. Uh, Tim, in St. Louis, if you ever get a chance to visit it, it's really a uh, interesting, interesting vehicle in downtown St. Louis. A lot of the other top members of the Hall of Fame were here. Bluth, Pisano, great meeting. Gary Skidmore looking to heat up. Strike! Skidmore felt like he was going to have a cakewalk when it started out. He threw the first ball very confidently in the first frame, but Bell answered, came back with a double. Skidmore opened in the third. Now Skidmore trails by 23. Needs a double to get back down to just 13 pins. Fifth frame. The first bad break Skidmore has had all day long. Watch this. Watch the ball as it enters the 1-3. Now, it should bounce and take out the 5 and the 9, not to be the ball is hit so strongly that the 5 pin is chopped directly off the 8. We're seeing that more and more often in professional bowling. The pins are just no match for the top pro bowler's power. Need some heavier pins. The amateurs don't want to hear that, but the pros don't want it. So he takes the one down, but you can see the expression on their faces. He wanted them all, needed them all. Trailing by 23. There's your leader, Ronnie Bell. Mm. The ability to carry pins is paramount here. Well, that's a great break, and that's one of the reasons he's a tournament leader. He made a mistake, and he made the mistake big enough to
Tim, that he didn't hit right up in the nose, the one, two, three zone. He crossed a little bit to the left side, taking out nine of the pins, left himself a very simple spare in the fifth frame. The three pin, he'll maintain a 23 pin lead. And the lead does stay at 23 for Ronnie Bell. As we head into the sixth frame, I remember when I went for my first title, Tim, you have a tendency when you have a big lead early to start looking back, thinking about only five frames, only five frames, become protective. If Ron Bell becomes protective of that 23 pin lead, Skidmore will run right over him. Bell must continue to attack. Is that aggressive enough? Just can't do it any better than that. Solid in the pocket. Ron told me before the match that his target is normally the arrows, but now he's looking farther down the lane because the back hands are really holding tight, the back ends. The ball is really hooking in nicely down low. Look back at the scoreboard, the fifth frame. Yep paramount importance to Larry um, Gary Skidmore in the fifth frame he left that solid eight he would have had a, only a three pin deficit if he had carried that strike it's still 23 pins but he's in the same situation he was in, in the fifth frame he can cut the lead of Ron Bell's down to 13 pins with another strike I'll tell you that that Skidmore's ball hits like a hammer back there. I mean, bow. He lets that good loft, but he doesn't bounce the ball, Tim. If you bounce the ball out over the foul line, you'll end up having a, a, a weak bowling ball. But Skidmore lofts it out and lifts it out, and that's a big difference. The leader, Ronnie Bell. Bingo. Ronnie Bell, good concentration. Knows he needs this one to keep the pressure on Gary Skidmore to keep his lead. He knew it when he let go of it. Amazing the experience, what it will do. Seven years ago, Ron Bell had the physical abilities he has right now, but he didn't have that mental aspect, and that's the difference among the top pros. Eighth frame, 23 pins. Ten. He looks determined, unperturbed by the 10 pin. He wanted it, but he's by no means giving up on the shot. Bell converted the 10 pin in the third frame, had no problems with it. He needs to convert it here to maintain his lead of 22 pins. After this telecast, Bo, I think we should go down and see if that 10 pin is sitting in a hole. <laughs> he got it. So many times today. That 10 pin has stood strong. Scoreboard tells a story, Tim. Eighth frame, just so important for Skidmore. He has to close down the lead of Ron Bell, put some pressure on him as they enter the last two frames. Skidmore's been there before, performed in the clutch, been a winner. Bell, still an unknown quantity. Working the eighth frame, two strikes. Make it three! You couldn't have walked down there and placed the ball more neatly in the pocket in such a crucial situation as Gary Skidmore there. Look at the experience. Cool under the pressure. $33,000 all on the line in this match. And he throws it perfect. Now he's got to where he can really squeeze Ron Bell. A strike here. And with just as you look at the first breakdown, 16,000 difference. Can cut the lead of Bells down to just two pins. Oh, that tenseness. The intensity. And the conversion. Some people say there's no defense in bowling, but until you sit in the seat that Ron Bell's sitting in right now and feel the pressure of Gary Skidmore just squeezing and squeezing and squeezing, you know what pressure and defense is all about. 
Bell, let's see how he reacts. He only leads by two pins. Ninth and tenth frames coming up. Hit it high. Didn't get the carry, left one up. Oh, and what a great break. You know, if those two pins stand, it's an even match after the spare. With the two, with this single pin standing, he still have a one pin lead going into the tenth frame. You see his breathing pick up. You can imagine his heartbeat rate. 150 or better. Needs it. And just barely got it. Well, he's limping to the finish line, but he doesn't have the race one yet. He lets this ball go. A very simple spare, the three pin, but it's amazing when $30,000 or more on the line just nicks it. The situation for these two players is simply this. Skidmore can shoot 236. Bell cannot shut him out. Skidmore has a strike working. He knows he got a break, a reprieve, temporarily. It's not I think over the breeze yet. of the ball yeah. knocked it over. He has asked tournament director Harry Golden for a re-rack. If Bell strikes on this ball, he forces Skidmore to strike. We have the possibility of a tie match. Even more so sets up the possibility of a tie match. Let's look at the scoreboard. Right now, Bell with a spare and a strike would end up with 215. Skidmore with nine spare strike would end up with 215. It's not all over. It's going down to the very last ball. Can you remember the last time that happened? Well, it happens almost every week out here, but not so much for the championship and a guy's first title. Got it. I honestly cannot remember that happening in the, the final five playoff. The tie match? Mm -hmm. We've had, oh, I'd bet 10 or 12 of them over the last few years uh, that I've worked the championship round. I can't recall one for the title, the title match, Tim. Um, but we do have that possibility here. Bell with a strike would be a 215, Skidmore going at a 216 pace. Needs it. Needs it. Two fourteen. Skidmore needs to fill 19 pins in the 10th frame. A strike on the first ball, and he is the winner. Nine spare nine. It's a tie. Nine spare strike. It's a winner. The 10, what a powerful ball, and the way he trusted that ball out, it was as his heading down the lane, everybody thought it was going to be light. He put a little extra lift on it, got it to break back to the head pin, and now he's put himself in a situation where he must convert this 10 pin and get a strike to win. The crowd knows the situation. Spare, strike, win. Spare, nine, tie. Spare, eight, Lose. On target. Everybody knows the score. Strike, it's a winner. Eight, it's a loser. Nine, initiates a sudden death two frame roll off for the $33,000 first prize. As a viewer, as a fan, as a bowler, it doesn't get any better than this. Agree.
and with it he carries $33,000 with him in prize money. Here it is, the loft, the lift, the discipline, and the money. And we'll be back. It just could not be any better for the final here at the showboat. Gary Skidmore wins it over Ronnie Bell. The final 215-214 in one of the most exciting matches we have seen in quite some time. And we'll talk to Gary, and we'll talk to the folks here and the trophy presentation, and of course that check. But first, let's check in with Chris Shankle in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Chris? And here in Lancaster, a live shot of a capacity crowd that will see two Olympic champions, Tyrell Biggs and Mark Breland, facing their sternest tests to date. Biggs and Tillis are just about coming into the ring here, and of course, we'll be back to show it to you live. Tillis with 24 knockouts and 31 wins. On the other hand, Biggs is going for his seventh straight knockout in only seven fights. He is a big, rangy, fast Olympic champion. And he has the world championship on his mind. So does Breland. And before we go back to Tim Brandt and Bo Burton, I want to congratulate a neat guy, Gary Skidmore, for his victory today. Back to Las Vegas. And thank you very much, Chris. And I'm with Gary Skidmore and his lovely wife. And Joe Kelly is here. And what a finish. Well, I want to say thank you. Uh, I got a couple of breaks, uh, and fortunately for me, the pins fell when I need them to. Uh, Ron Bogle bowled great all week. Uh, last night, he came out and uh, shot well over 300 over, won all eight of his matches, go from eighth to take the lead after leading the qualifying, and he bowled great. My hat's off to Ron. You bowled outstanding, Ron. And Joe, thank you for a great week here at the showboat. Thank you very much, Jim. It's been a pleasure having all of you folks here to put the cameraman all the way down. It has been a pleasure, our pleasure, and $33,000 richer for Gary Skidmore. So that's the story here. Coming up next on ABC's Wide World of Sports Olympic gold medalist, Fight On. Undefeated welterweight Mark Breland in his first 10-round bout takes on Troy Wortham, who was 25-0. You'll also see undefeated heavyweight Tyrell Biggs, who has knocked out his last six opponents. He'll be facing his toughest fight to date when he meets James Quick Tillis. Boxing action coming up next on ABC's Wide World of Sports. Travel arrangements made through in a promotional fee paid by United Airlines. United flies more people to Hawaii than any other airline. Nobody knows Hawaii like United. This has been a presentation of...